I was born in Singapore. In, 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 in two amber mansions, Orchard Road, because that's the way it used to be done in those days. Women went into labor in their own beds. And uh, I was, I, I, and uh, we were, Orchard Road, Orchard Road was the main thoroughfare in Singapore at that time. And, uh, and that's it. I was born in 1938, and um, it was in a, um, it was on the site of a, a, an old cow shed, which was replaced by a hospital, a maternity hospital, and uh, I think it was a poorer part of Singapore than um, the area in which Moshi lived, uh, but. Um, Anyway, um, I was born, my mother told me afterwards that I was five pounds when I was born and I was black and blue all over. So <laughs> I've always remembered that. My grandparents, my grandparents left Baghdad in uh, 18, 1880 or something like that. Yes, I thought so. And my grandmother was, I think, in her seventh or eighth month uh, on the ship. And the captain said to her, we have no facilities, madam. When they got to Bombay, there were no facilities, madam. I think you should get off here because there's a, you know, there are hospitals. And, uh, and she, she, she came off and my father was born in Bombay. And when he was three months old, they got onto the next ship and continued their voyage to Singapore. Well, um, Moshe's grandfather um, was, um, he always, <clears throat> sorry, he always ended up um, the, the richer brother of the two brothers. Uh, in fact, there were three brothers, I believe, but one brother moved away and was never heard from. But um, my grandfather, um, he d did the spice route. Um, but he stopped in Bombay, unlike Moshe's uh, grandfather. He stopped in Bombay and lived there for a f number of years. And uh, my father was actually born there. And I think my father must have been quite a, quite a grown-up small boy before they moved to Singapore. Because my father was always um, had a very strong affinity with India and he learned uh, the language which he spoke at home quite a lot and he sang all the songs and I learned an awful lot from him. I was very protective. I was brought up in cotton wool <laughs> as the saying goes because I came late in my my parents life. My mother was my mother was 30 something and my father was already in his 40s and there was, okay, I have three sisters and the oldest one is 18 years my senior. So there was a huge gap and by the time I came, uh, I was, uh, I was, I was mollycoddled. And it was, uh, I wasn't allowed to do anything. I wasn't allowed to play games and so on and so on and so on. Because my mother actually was married when she was 15. And she had her first child when she was 16. And that child was still born. And I was another boy after three girls and they wanted to be sure that this one lived. 
and uh, so, uh, like I say, I was, I was, I was really, I was really mollycoddled and kept um, very, very safely. I, as I said, I, I, I always had to have an ama in attendance. Oh, it was a very happy childhood, I must say. My father was an amazing man because he had this great love of uh, music and um, language, languages. And um, we lived in a humble flat in Singapore after the war, um, having moved several times uh, before then. Um, and um, it was a new Singapore um, Improvement Trust flat that's right. And uh, we lived there. I was there with them for the rest of my time in Singapore. And um, we always had so many people in the house because my father was very popular. I mean, he was, um, he, he was a raconteur and he also loved music. So there was music, dancing, and people would come and go. It was a house that was open, well, it was a flat, actually, and it was open to anybody who wanted to come in. Uh, we are very much, obviously, very, very much a minority. Uh, the, 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 the population was mainly Chinese. Then, then the second largest was the Indians, the Tamils. And then the Malays were, they didn't really come down to Singapore. The Malays stayed more or less in Malaya. And the Malays who lived in Singapore lived in kampongs. They kept to themselves. Um, they were fishermen and people like that. They, they, didn't, they didn't look for further education. So it was, uh, uh, yeah, so we did mix. I mean, you, you couldn't help it. We did mix a lot. And I, I had, uh, I had lots of Chinese friends. And I remember even after I went back, uh, by then I was married. We were always entertaining in our home, uh, and the Jews were always in the minority. We always had a lot of Indians and Chinese and vi other visitors who would come and, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. You know, we had our Jewish friends, but. Um, there were so many other people living, different denominations living in Singapore. And you came, you came across them, you know, in your everyday life. And you got to know some of them very well. And you, um, so you associated with them and you, had, you, went, you went out with them, you know, in groups and uh, individually as well. It was wonderful. Uh, it was a cosmopolitan society. You know, you had you had to be, you couldn't just be contained in uh, the Jewish community, which was quite small at the time. It was yes. quite small. It was small. It was small. Yeah, the Jewish community has never been so big as it was after we left. Yes. For Scotia, one hundred percent. And because we didn't have somebody who could uh, slaughter cows in those days, uh, we had no beef in our diet. It was chicken, chicken and fish. The uh, shohet would come in and he would slaughter the chickens at home. Okay, or we would take it to the synagogue and then bring it home. And that's what we ate. Uh, it was only very much later on when they were getting kosher meat from Australia that uh, it, it beef was introduced into our diet. But <clears throat> other than that, it was it was chicken all the way. Nothing else. Ah, oh, we ate quite simply. My mother would go to the market, mostly vegetables and fish fish and vegetables and um, <clears throat> um, and she my when my father first married my mother she was taught of course my mother was from China she was taught by one of my father's sisters Flora Farha she was known as 
um, to cook um, the Middle Eastern way, which is where they came from. And um, my mother would make, especially on special occasions, she would make um, different dishes like, um, I have to say the, um, uh, the, the, what, the, the known words for these dishes, uh, alu makala, plow, ball, where she did, um, she made uh, cakes out of uh, potato. That's with, it. Yes, <laughs> with a alu filling. Chop. <laughs> alu chop. Alu chop. <laughs> alu chop. And, uh, and, and we, we had hameen, uh, hameen, is it? Hameen, isn't it? Hameen. Hameen. It was, it was chicken, chicken cooked overnight on a, was, on a, on a, on a stove, night. on a, an old fashioned um, coal stove and left overnight to cook for the Sabbath the next day. Um, and otherwise we lived on mainly fish and, fish and vegetables mm -hmm. at home. I remember the war very, very well. I was um, 1930, 1940, 41, 1941. No, it was, no, it was December the 7th. Okay, December the 7th, 1941, they bombed Pearl Harbor. And that was in the afternoon. That was in the afternoon, yes. And they bombed Singapore uh, on Wednesday, uh, on the 8th of May, uh, the 8th of December, in the early hours of the morning. I think it was three or four o'clock in the morning, which means to say the two flights took off at much the same time much the same time because Pearl Harbor is the other side of the international dateline. And I remember very well, I remember that night very clearly. I was, oh, we lived in Orchard Road, which was just a quarter mile from Government House. And they were trying to bomb Government House, but they bombed all around. They missed it and because we lived just down the road from there, there was a lot of bombing in our area and that's what woke me up. I got out of bed and said, what's that noise? And I found my family, they all, uh, as I said, and I had two grown up sisters. My mother and father were sitting around the radio listening to what was going on <laughs> and they told and of course the the newscaster said that we have been bombed by the Japanese without a declaration of war and the declaration of war I mean they, they sacked the two the two the, the repulse, battleship and the and the something. cruiser the Prince of Wales and the Repulse was sunk uh, at the same time. I mean, there were, <clears throat> it was pretty much, the whole thing was happening at the same time. And I remember they were sitting around the radio listening to the report that the Prince of Wales, the Repulse had been sunk. Japan has bombed Singapore without declaring war. But what we later found out was that they had <clears throat> come down through Thailand. Mm -hmm. Thailand gave them an open, open, uh, what's the word? Oh, open so. passage. You can, you can go through. I mean, Thailand, Thailand does that. Thailand has never been involved in a war. <clears throat> she's always stayed neutral and she's always made friends with anybody. So they came, they came down Thailand through Malaya and Singapore was gone within, I think it was exactly, exactly 10 weeks 
from from the day that they they, they bombed us until they took Singapore was exactly seven ten weeks, seventy days. I mean that's a that's a hell of a it's a, it's a long march for seventy days because they came on bicycles, yeah. right? You you know that they came yes. on they yes. came on bicycles. They didn't have tanks or anything. And then when Singapore was uh, was occupied, that was it. <clears throat> we didn't get back for three and a half years, and we were deck passengers, literally deck passengers. We, uh, we were somebody. Uh, we were literally sleeping on the deck, literally, because we were not white. The cabins. And the dining rooms were reserved for the whites only. Literally, I promise you, I'm not making this up. It was whites only. And we, my mother, my mother bribed some of the the, the waiters to give us food. But because we were kosher, we lived virtually. We lived on bread. And a bit of cheese and uh, fish, if there ever was fish, and, and 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 then some fruit, and that was it. We were not allowed to take a bath, and that was you know, to to have a <laughs> to have a bath. You had to have a cabin, and we were not allowed in the cabins. So my mother, again, she bribed. Uh, she bribed uh, the cabin boys to find a place for us to have a bath. And while we were having a bath, there was an air raid. And I, <laughs> I don't know if I'm telling you too much. <laughs> there was an air raid. And because I was the only boy, it was my mother and my two sisters, I couldn't bathe with them. So I had to be bathed. I was given a very quick bath, I was put out of the bathroom virtually naked while they could have their bath. And that gave me um, a tick. And it stayed with me for years. I had a tick in my eye. I've only just got rid of it about, I don't know, five years ago. That's amazing. It stayed with me all those years. I mean, it's well, quite incredible. I don't remember anything about it, nothing about it. I think I was about three years old. And uh, it was only through my sister Sally, who was 10 years older, um, who um, th that um, I gained some information about what happened. And apparently we managed to get on the last ship to leave Singapore, um, the Felix Roussel, which zigzagged all the way to India, to Bombay, with bombs dropping on either side. So we were extremely lucky to get there intact. Um, and would you like me to continue about Bombay? Uh, I do remember bits about Bombay. We were put into a a camp which was well I don't know if it was a camp because I don't remember other Jews being there but we were in a sort of um, compound area with um, uh, walls all around and I remember these stone dwellings it, my memory just it, it just I somehow I think about where we lived as a stone dwelling, or it, it must have been better than that. And we were surrounded by mills, cotton mills, people making cotton. Um, and we were, we were in, um, by colour, you were right. in the smarter part. You yes, were in, we were in Calaba. Calaba. Yes, we were put into, the, into that particular area. And I remember that I had a I had a Muslim friend. She was a little older than myself, but I grew up there from the age of three 
until I was ju until I was just before eight. Um, so we were there for quite a long time. Yes, yes, yes. I actually written it. <laughs> Never follow your heart. Never follow. Your Never heart. follow your heart. Follow your head. <laughs> I was in love with my wife, and that was it. And I followed what she said, and I did. I did. It. I more or less. I, I I came here because of her. She she couldn't she couldn't find peace in Singapore. So that was it. I wanted to keep my family together. Mm -hmm. I think for me, love of family is the most important thing in life. The love within a family and the love for one's family, the most important part of life. Ah. That's it. I was trying to write a history of the um, of the Jewish community in Singapore, but I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not an historian. I I can't go looking for facts and figures and putting them together. So I thought the best thing to do was to write it in, as a novel. By the way, I've written six novels, okay? And they're upstairs, which I, I've never been able to get them published. And I've never just left them alone. But this one was a... A work of, it was a work that gave me an enormous amount of pleasure, because it allowed me to remember things, and to cast them in a manner that I found very favourable. But I put them, I I took this family through the Japanese occupation because I think that made the biggest difference to my life. It really affected me an awful lot. I mean, it changed my life. There's no question about it. It was, you know, from one day to the next, it was a complete change of life. A I had a father who <coughs> was very capable of running and so on. And if my father had lived, my life would have been completely different. I don't know what I would, I might never have become a naval architect. I might have just gone with him and gone into his business, who knows? Again, that could have happened, but uh, I, uh, so I, I I I tried to I, I tried to I tried to capture something that that I had lost. That's really what it was. Well, um, this is very precious. Uh, this little sheaf of letters. <clears throat> they were written on airmail paper, as we used to do in the old days. Yeah. And um, several of them came from my father, who was uh, well into his 80s at that point. And um, he, was, he was in a very poorly state. He was ill. He was still very poor. Um, I did try on the odd occasion to send money. I was working in London. I was working in London um, when I came from when I came from Singapore and um, I was earning good money. I, uh, when I left school, I did um, a stenography course. In fact, I was doing it in the evenings whilst I was at school. And um, so then I came to work for the same firm that I'd worked for in Singapore. And uh, I used to very occasionally send a little bit of money over to my parents. But um, he, he wrote to me in the last year before he passed away um, to say that um, he was ill and, and my mother was ill too. And uh, when are you coming to see us because we miss you? And, um, uh, it, you know, it was very sad. Mm -hmm.